Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Everyone, welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Uh, our guest today is Andy Setcher, and we can either talk to him about heavy metal or trilobites. It's going to be up to him. First things first, Andy's you know, kind of a serial careerist. He was the editor of Hit Parader, a staple magazine in my house throughout the 70s, which shows you both, all of you, how old we both are. So <laughs> we can compare and contrast Ozzy with an organism that is approximately the same age as he is, or we can also discuss uh, what caused the disappearance of Axl Rose versus the same fate suffered by the trilobite. So Andy has written a great book called Travels with Trilobites, published by my favorite press, Columbia University Press. It'll be released on May 12th. So I think most of us know what a trilobite is. It's one of those, hey, that's a trilobite creature, because they're so weird looking and recognizable with their cool shape, streamlined body with its lateral indentations and its three-lobed carapace, um, looking like a pod that might be ejected by an evil interstellar warship. It's a little bit like those translucent alien bugs you find in your sink or your bathtub at night. In any event, they were around 500 million years ago and lasted like a quarter of a billion years, a lot longer than we will given the current state of affairs. So who were they? What were they? How many kinds were there? Where did you find them? Where did they hang out? How did they go extinct? And most importantly, why does Andy care? So Andy, Andy is always cared, but I will correct you and start this on a contentious foot right at the beginning. That it's I, trilobite, not trilobite, because it's. Oh, that's important. great. It is important only because you mispronounced my name too. It's the I'm used to. No, it's okay. Okay, um, Secker, it, Secher? What is it? I'm sorry. It's fine. fine. I, I'm used to every. Hey, you is fine. I've been used to it all my life. It's trilobes because. Oh, three most people think That they are trilobites would be because of the head, body, and tail. It is not. It's because of the three lateral lobes that divide their symmetry. So you have the trilobes that create the trilobite. And as you say, they existed for a quarter of a billion years, had 25,000 recognized species, even though I believe there are probably many, many more than that. Uh, in fact, every year there's new ones being found in Morocco, in Russia, in Australia, even in the US, where they're just expanding this number. But most collectors only collect the whole specimen, not the partial ones, because that's what most scientists do. They'll find a little bit of a genal spine, which just comes off the, the head or a bit of the tail, and they'll name a new species after, usually after themselves. And collectors don't care about those things. We throw those away when we're in the field. We only want the complete, nice, beautiful example that you can put on your shelf and examine. In fact, I could turn around this, which I'll do in a minute, and show you a few that are. Can you see the ones behind me over here? There's a whole stand of them yeah. there. Where the, hell, where the hell do you keep all these things? You got uh, thousands of them. I, I luckily have a big apartment here on three levels, and one level is basically all trilobites. Another is all platinum albums, so it's all good. And there are guitars on the wall over there. See the guitars, the autograph guitars? There. there we go. So there's all sorts of weird stuff there. So, sorry. Well, no, it's all right. So, you know, uh, you know you're going to get asked the same questions in all these interviews, but like. I don't want to answer any of them, so forget it. I've already answered them. No, go ahead. Sorry. So, well, first of all, like, you know, normally they're going to say, what are trilobites? But my question is, when the hell did you get interested in them and why? I was seven years old going to elementary school, and I get on the bus, going to school, a small little van, and on the seat was this little trilobite. The guy said he found it that day, that he was driving around his home, found it and brought it in. It was a little Devonian trilobite from a little up outside of New York City, and I was fascinated. I still have it someplace here. I don't know where it is, but it's not complete, but it's little fake hops, or elder jumps now, pardon me, and um, that made me interested. And as my room, my space grew, my income grew because it's not a poor man's hobby. It's something that if you're going to do this between traveling and the collecting can run you quite a bit of money. I started to expand. And before I knew it, I've been doing it now for 30 years. Uh, I got about 5,000 specimens here. It must be really cool that, you know, yeah, it costs money, but it must be really cool because if you love travel, you must have seen the, almost the whole world. Well, one of the benefits of the rock and roll side of things is as yeah. I would go around, I used to, they say, where do you want to go see Guns N' Roses or ACDC? 
And I took these obscure places and said, why do you want to go there? And it was always because I was a collector, a museum, or a site I wanted to visit. And a lot of the times when I'd come back home after that, I would do a story for a number of magazines that existed back then that would touch upon natural history. And I would talk about, you know, visiting Dudley, England, or visiting wherever it might be around the world, various sites, and it was great. So I had this compendium of maybe a dozen stories I'd already done. Then I became an association with the American Museum of Natural History, started putting a lot of my specimens as well as those stories there. And I would say about five years ago, the idea struck me to, hey, let's combine these, expand on this idea, and make a book out of it. In fact, not only have I done that book, I got a second one coming out. So it's... You know, since we're trying to sell the first one, so you can do yeah. the second one. So I don't have a copy because I just had the PDF. So you hold up the, the... Come on. Yeah, it's been delayed. This thing should have been out with COVID a year and a half ago. It's been delayed, delayed, delayed. <clears throat> the most recent one was the binding had a problem. So it got delayed another three weeks. So I should have had it in my hands as you should have. And right now it is not happening. So uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. I think, I, I, think, I think Amazon has the cover. Hold on. They do. Yeah, let me show I'll show you that. Hold on. That'd be nice. Because... Like I said, um, I have a bookstore, and you know, I say it every time. As many people will say you can't judge a book by its cover. Every single person comes up and, and it has a, it has a really cool cover because I did look at it on. Oh, shit. That is a, a Chiaroras from uh, from Russia, St. Petersburg area. Well, I right now I have a moratorium on buying anything from Russia for obvious reasons, but up until two or three months ago. They were my primary outlook. Yeah, well, that's the cover. There it is. Yes. And I say yes, that's so a tourist. It actually stretches around to the back cover. And that's about 450 million years old. That's sort of vision from the St. Petersburg. Um, the, there's a whole horizon there that produces some of the most amazing three-dimensional trilobites in the world. The thing that's so cool about it, like I said about the cover, it's like, depending on the mindset of the person coming in, it's almost impossible to not buy that book. I mean... <laughs> At least notice it, if not buy it. Exactly, and they sit on the, you know, it'll sit on the front pay, uh, table, and people are going to see it and go, "Holy, you know, shit, this is this looks looks so cool." Like I said, that's the other thing about it; it's so alien in nature, you know. And the fact very that much, so. very much so. Why do Why do you think that is? I mean, it's like you know, I always think about like um, since they lasted so long. I think about like crocodiles and cockroaches, and it's like they went evolutionarily wise. They go, "Hey, this is cool. We'll just stay like this." And well, you pretty much have it. I mean, I think when they came out in the Cambrian, they reached their evolutionary widest dispersity uh, soon after they emerged. And after that, it's been a slow, steady decline for the next 250 million years. So I think they reached a degree of evolutionary perfection almost as soon as they arrived. There's been a lot of different changes. Yeah. You know, they got bigger, they got smaller. Some had eyes, some had huge compound eyes, some had no eyes. So as they filled various ecological niches within the marine environment, and they were strictly marine, you know, there are stories now that they might have first come out on land very early in the Cambrian. There's some scientific speculation that they might have come out like horseshoe crabs, whether for breeding or for just Maybe. gathering food or whatever, just on, you know, on the banks, maybe not totally out of the water, and gone back in. And that could have been very, very early. There's evidence down in Alabama and in Georgia with lower Cambrian alanellids that show cruciana, they call them, which are the walking marks uh, of trilobite legs. And they apparently were fossilized and only begun that way on a dry or semi-dry environment. Well, you know, it's funny. Question, uh, Go ahead. Um, what I was going to say was, uh, oh, yeah. So I just interviewed this lady last week who wrote about uh, basically the day the dinosaurs went extinct. And then they found last week a dinosaur that they think died on the day yeah, of yeah. the asteroid. But uh, trilobites didn't, apparently, according to you, didn't die because of one specific extinction event, right? Well, their final demise happened at an extinction event at the end of the Permian, but they were very much in a very steep decline. There were 10 orders of trilobites, let's say with 25,000 different species recognized so far. And this has come down to all in one order, the proedids, uh, for the final 100 million years of their existence. So really, after the Devonian, they were pretty much on their last legs. They tended to be small, 
rather similar in shape, all rather oval, maybe only three to four centimeters in length. And when the, the end of the Permian, that extinction event happened, which is the biggest one ever, bigger than the one involving the dinosaurs, they were gone, and gone for good. It's funny, I saw a trilobite yesterday because I was in DC and I went to the Natural the History Museum. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I know, and I'm going, wait a minute, I'm interviewing this guy tomorrow and here's these trilobites, it was just so cool. It's, and it's well, I went to school in DC, so I spent a lot of time at the uh, Smithsonian. In fact, the, the director there is one of the guys that did a forward for my book, Kirk Johnson. Oh, yeah, I read it. It was, that's a, it was a good forward. Because um, that's another thing that people like in the books, especially my customers. They like epigraphs and they like introductions, acknowledgments, footnotes, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's, hey, here's what, a. What, what is an epigraph? Let me learn something. Epigraph is like what you say at the beginning, like by Mark Twain or Albert Einstein. Oh, or, okay. You're like gotcha. you know, someone says, "Hey, trilobites are the coolest thing I ever seen." Albert Einstein. <laughs> wow! See, I, I didn't know there was a term for that. Now I learned something. Thank you. Okay. Just make one up for your second book. <laughs> yeah. Don't Sam find Hankin. it. Sam yeah. Hankins says, "Hey, so here's a stupid question: now, Are there any rock bands that remind you of trilobites?" I've been looking for somebody in any band that would show any interest. Slash from Guns N' Roses collected dinosaur teeth. And so he expressed some interest, but most of the time I get the typical blank look when you get almost asked me any question of those bands. So, uh, and no band really reminds me of that. There was one band I think called the Trilobites. I don't like their music though. So uh, that's about as close as it got. Hey, so switching back to the book since we're trying to sell it. So one of the things that intrigued me, and I kind of guess I understand it, is you're finding all these fossils of Trilobites, but in one of your interviews you're saying, very seldom, no, almost impossibly do you find soft parts preserved. Right, you find right. a couple of eggs, but why is it that there's, there aren't any? It's the type of preservation. Most of the rock is a sandstone, a mudstone, and a lot of times it's not fine enough for that. And you also have to have a proper kind of preservation where it is covered very quickly. The most famous place for this, pardon me, is the Burgess Shale of the British Columbia, which is a middle Cambrian location found by the legendary Charles Walcott, who was one of the first directors at Smithsonian to kind of bring that all back in a loop. And you found, you find antenna and sometimes walking legs there. And that was really all we knew of trilobite soft part preservation for a century, from the late 1800s to the late 1900s. And at that point, there was a place called Chenjiang in China, which is lower camper. And it's actually about 10 million years older than uh, Burgess. And they were finding creatures there, alamelids, with antenna, walking legs, gut tracks, all sorts of stuff. But what you're referring to, though, is a place in New York State, actually, which is Ordovician, called Beecher's Trilobite Beds, which actually find these beautifully pyrotized things called triarthrus that actually now are beautifully eventually preserved, show antenna, show all that stuff, but also now have shown eggs, which is the first time we've ever seen that trilobites. You know... Like I said, from the cover on, it's really interesting. And at first I was going, why would anyone be interested in this? But it kind of sucks you in. Plus, the same sense of humor that the banter that you and I are doing right now is kind of in the book, too. Well, and I always think that... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, humor really helps a reader to move forward through a book, you know? I'm not a scientist, nor do I play one on TV or on video. I'm a stupid rock and roll guy who loves trilobites, and I'm trying to convey my enthusiasm and kind of bring a rock and roll perspective. I mean, to me, this is infotainment, to quote, uh, to quote David Lee Roth. You know, this is great Paleozoic infotainment, and that's what it is. You can read this for fun. I think anybody who has no knowledge of trilobites just wants to get wrapped up in the locations. I mean, in a way, the motivation was more Anthony Bourdain and the way he approached food that, you know, food is great, but it was about the location, the people, just everything tied in with the event than it was actually what he was there to, to deal with. Same thing here. My stories, I think, are a little about the history of the location, a lot about the people involved, a lot about what's going on in and around the scene. And then you got the trilobites, which is great, you know. So they're kind of there. They're a simple, the simple role, but they're not the only thing. This is far from science. Uh, I like to believe it's an entertaining read more than an educational one. You'll learn something, it's your fault, not mine. And the cool thing is, the one part that's hard is the very beginning of each chapter where you give the taxonomy and the location and the Latin aspect. Of that And that was really cool too. It's, and everything is hard to pronounce. 
I couldn't oh, do yeah, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, I'm a big sports fan, too. And to me, I say it's kind of like learning the guys on your team. You know, I know Barry Bonds. I know Willie Mays. So those names come to me right away. But so does Dal- Dalmanides Limulura, Sartorius Boltoni. And they it's all tripping me off the tongue after a while. I don't think about it. Sometimes you find yourself talking to other problem like guys. And you sound like the ultimate nerd because they're throwing out these long Latin names. And people are looking at you like, what the hell are you saying? And sometimes you say, I don't really know. But you have to give that. That's the one thing I do believe, whether it's on the museum site or in this book, I wanted to have the standard collector information, which you should have on any specimen you ever find and collect. The name, the author, the guy who first described it in literature. In other words, the genus, species, author, year, age, location, uh, formation, if you got it, and uh, size. Just so in case it ever gets lost. But those are the, the things I think I list on all the different trilobites, and I think it's important. And I also have a little field note there that tells you its historical significance or where it was found or why it's interesting, or something to look for in the specimen of the photos. And I took all the photos, which I'm very proud of because I can't take photos. No, they're very photogenic. <laughs> that, well, they made it easy. They don't move very much, which is nice. Not like photographing babies or something, you know, so uh, they kind of just lie there and you can take them all day long and they don't complain. Yeah, I know. It reminds me of that Rodney Dangerfield movie where he be, he's a photographer, you know, he, <laughs> he gets mad at the kids. <laughs> you know, oh, the other question you always get, and, and it's another thing, the reader's like hoping this will happen, but it doesn't. It's like, they don't really have any descendants. The closest you get is when you talk about the horseshoe crab, but they're really, they kind of like <laughs> said, okay, goodbye. That's it. I do a thing called Trial by Tuesday for the museum on their Facebook and Instagram page. And no matter what I put up, and it's different people every week, hey, it looks like a horseshoe crab. It must be related to horseshoe crab. And every two or three months, they'll say, no, it's not. No, it's not. Because you can't do it every week. But that is the general consensus that they must have something that has evolved from them. And when they died, the whole entire line died out. There is no direct trial by descendants. They're arthropods. So arthropods share certain characteristics, but there are no creatures alive today that say we descended from trilobites. You know, for the past three weeks, this is not going to sell your book, but you know, there's such, so little good rock and roll now that I've been mourning Taylor Hawkins, who's like the nicest guy you know, for so, I mean, it was yeah. so important to me, you know, it was like, it's not like John Lennon, which I know exactly where I was sitting and all that stuff, December 8th, 1980 and Howard Cosell and all that. But Taylor Hawkins, you know, you see the last concert and all that stuff. It's just, and it's he, the full play. Who fighters are like the last standing, last exactly. band standing in many ways. You know, they won all the awards. Why? The albums weren't that great now, weren't as good as the early ones. They were the only ones who were qualified. You know, Greta exactly. Van Fleet, you know, great, fine. You made a nice couple of good early songs, but what have you done since? And there's nobody else. I mean, there are a couple of bands that are hanging in there. They're trying to do some new stuff, but it's, it's a 20th century form, you know, just as trial bites had their time, rock and roll had its time too. And this ain't it, unfortunately. Now, at least they have a chance of coming back where trial bites don't, but I don't know if it will. The labels just don't really want to have that. I don't think they like the, the, the <coughs> pardon me. They don't like the demographic. And I don't yeah, think I mean, he, really... <coughs> he had, when he was a drummer, he had a front man who died. When he was a front man, he had a drummer who died. It's, it's amazing, just... isn't it? Yeah. I know. Well, okay, let's go back to it. Um, oh, yeah, so the deal was, um, and, and the only reason I'm going back to it is because it's interesting. Because So what you're saying is either they may have started a little bit on land and gone into the water, or they may have been in water all the time, and they just came a little bit out of the land. And, and when you're thinking about stuff like that, you go, okay, like the walking catfish or whatever comes out, they kind of tend to go, okay, this is better, this is better. But they didn't. They, they didn't do that. No. Again, this is very early, and this is still very highly speculative. I've seen one scientific paper on it came out within the last year. Um, and there, the thought is that these, this one particular genus of lower Cambrian trilobites may have done this little dance on the, the tidal shelf, we'll call it, or the, it's, you know, the beach. But I don't recall seeing anything subsequent to that. And evidently it was not a preferred lifestyle. It didn't provide any benefit. You know, I have to assume trilobites, first they were strictly marine, weren't brackish like Eurypterids, apparently only seawater, but they lived in various levels. Most of them evidently were crawlers. You have the crawling legs. Some were floaters and some were apparently swimmers. 
Hearts always differentiate. Sometimes you think the body shape would, would say, these guys are probably swimmers, these guys, it doesn't work that way. I mean, the guys you think are clumsy and clunky can sometimes swim. And the ones who look like they're hydrodynamic might be crawlers, but uh, they covered the various niches within that marine environment very well. But I don't think any evidence is for anything, any of them coming out of the land after that, so far anyhow. Well, let's go back to my two mispronunciations. Your name, I don't really care about. But, I don't the, but the trilobites, that three lobed thing, no one, they don't think of it in terms of that, you know? And you talk about that because they don't think of it in terms of lobes. You would think about that the, the body and the tail, the three parts, you know? But it's, it's definitely, someone came up with that other thing, which I think is stupid too. I mean, I call them crawly critters and be fine. And that'd be the nice scientific name for them. Everybody remember it. But the trilobites is a bit abstract, I must say. Well, if you talk about, like I just talked last week to some guy who was talking about um, pain. It was, a book was called Pain in the Brain. And he was talking about like one-celled organisms still had this kind of pain thing. You know, this idea that, okay, I'm getting away from this. I don't like this, I'm getting away. And so it's like, what... Where did they come from? How did they evolve into such complex creatures so early in our evolution? What did they start with? Like just one of the fascinating questions. You had the thing called, talk about mispronunciation, I might do it. The Echidarian, I believe it's pronounced, which is the Precambrian. And you have this, a lot of this rock in Australia, and you see things look like sponges or jellyfish. And I have a chapter in the book on the creatures that came before trilobites. And there's nothing you would see or say, uh, and say, that's, that's an early trilobite, that's a soft shell trilobite. It really just did not exist. But obviously these had worm-like predecessors because you can see on some of the very early ones, a thing called a, an epistothorax as a word for you. And it's worm-like little tail that comes down off of the end of the trilobite and it looks like a worm. But the rest of the trilobite is very advanced, rather, rather ornate. But I believe that this would be an indicator of an earlier worm-like ancestor. But well, you know, I always think it's really cool that, you know, all these vertebrates have the same thing we have. Tibia, fibula, humerus, radius, ulna, even dinosaurs. We're all kind of like linked. What did they have that we still have? I mean, they had eyes sometimes. They had the, a this is the key. I mean, a lot of people collect the ones that have the great eyes, the Devonian trilobites. They have, again, this pronunciation, schizocrol, holocrol, and not to get too scientific, but there are different types of eyes. But the ones I like the best are the compound eyes, almost like what flies have now. They have these rows. In fact, when I was 17 years old, I worked at the museum for Dr. Niles Eldridge, who did the famous work on punctuated equilibrium. And what I did was for an entire summer, I took trilobite heads of, of elder jobs, which are now elder jobs. They were fake hops back then, and counted the rows called the dorsoventral files on the compound eyes of the trilobite fake hops on. And by counting the rows, you could trace their migratory patterns. But those eyes for what are just hypnotic to some people because they are so well-preserved and you look at them and it's almost like you're communi communing with an animal that was alive 400 million years ago. What was the process by which, and this might be another reason people are fascinated, what was the process by which their fossilization became so accurate? Because when you see a well-preserved one, it's, it's how could it be fossilized in such a fashion that you can see these striations? Because so really heavy shells, in a lot of cases, a heavy calcite shell, and that tends to be all people think of as trilobites. So they don't think of the soft parts, the antenna, the legs. And these things, and again, for every one you find complete, I mean, I have friends who run quarries, they'll find disarticulated parts because they molted by either losing the cheeks and they pop out or the head would pop off and they pop out and we grow a shell. But usually you find, if you're lucky enough to find anything, a disarticulated piece. To find a complete specimen is still a true trilobite trophy. And again, there are so many different kinds of rocks and kinds of preservation. You go around the world and many times you can see the rock like the bottom side and know that what the specimen is going to be or where it's from just by the, the color of the rock, the quality of the uh, grains in the rock and then you turn over, okay, that's from the Czech Republic, you know, that's from the Buran, from whatever. And you can just tell from that up upstate New York where it's very fine grained at the Walcott Rust Quarry. And 
I think they were covered quickly. Uh, there were a lot of them. I mean, I think for every one that was fossilized, there probably were a hundred or a thousand that were not. And again, these were, they were fed upon, they were torn apart by currents, they were just swept away. So uh, I have to think a lot of them were not preserved, but the preservation is so great because the shell was so powerful and could be stand, withstand almost anything. Some get compressed, sometimes they get twisted, but a lot is perfectly preserved, almost like they put them back in water and they could walk away, crawl away, I should say walk. You know, one of the things you do at the beginning, kind of tongue in cheek again, is, you know, you're saying, we're talking about metric system and you just got to remember that's like two point so many centimeters yeah. to an inch. So, but then there's these species that are called gigantus, but people think they're like, okay, this big, but they're not. What, give an idea of using your hands or whatever of the, the smallest and the biggest. The smallest could be a millimeter or smaller. And the biggest, the biggest in record was 72 centimeters. So, which is what, three feet or something, you know, yeah. getting back to regular American talk. Uh, I mean, I have some over here and over here. I mean, they're 40 centimeters, 45. So they got me pretty big. And the question always gets down to then, if you're going to go back to arthropod thought, even though you don't know if it applies to trial bites, I mean, some lobsters lived for 100 years, supposedly, grew to 72 or 75 pounds, I think, and grew to be three feet long. So... Did trilobites live extended lives? And I have to think they did. If they weren't eaten, I think they might have lived for decades and could have attained that kind of size. So you've said eaten now twice. But yeah. who, eat, who ate them? In the Cambrian, there was a thing called anomalocaris, which is known as the terror of the Cambrian seas. Now, the debate is it had a mouth that looked like a pineapple core, but it was filled with teeth. And the question then becomes, was that mouth powerful enough to break through a trilobite carapace? It's a debate. That's one of those scientific things I'll leave to them. I'll just present that it's a debate. Um, in the Ordovician, I mean, you could have them praying. I think they were probably cannibalistic. I think they might have preyed, big ones preyed upon small ones. They also preyed upon the soft body things that existed back then. So um, I don't think anybody knows for sure, but you see, especially in the Cambrian, a lot with big bite marks on the pygidium. And it's just a question of what did that. I believe probably was an anomalous caris back then, which looked like a, I don't know how to describe it, looked like a giant worm. No, a giant shrimp more like it, but had these big tentacles and had this huge mouth plate right in the middle of its face and could just probably do a lot of damage. So, well, so then you, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say throughout the book, you admit that there is some, there is a lot of speculation so like if you say to yourself, I, hey, I think they're cannibalistic, but what's the base information that you access that allows you to even assume that they might have been? Because just as you say, what could be the predator? You look in the fossil record, there aren't that many things. I mean, you would think right. a large predator would have some evidence. When you get to Devonian, you have armored fish, you have cephalopods you have other things that you think could have preyed upon trilobites there's no evidence yet of it you don't find you know fecal matter with trilobite parts in it yet to the best of my knowledge but back i'm going back more to the cambrian it seems like that's the only possibility that's either cannibalistic or anomalous caris i think when you move along where cannibalism could still exist i think you have more possible predators out there when uh you know, when you talk about them, we talked about them evolutionarily be stable, cool, but like, like a 56 Chevy or something, they're still driving in Cuba. <laughs> yeah. But like, okay, then, and then you say this gradual decline, but not an extinction event. So is it like acid rain? Is it, yeah, I don't understand well, what went wrong. I think it was that they, we said earlier, they were kind of evolutionarily perfect, quote unquote, when they came right. out. You have a long period of time where other creatures are now coming along that are taking up their various ecological niches and might be further advanced, might be better prepared to seize this opportunity or that. Then you have the fish come along. Then you have more predators. And suddenly, creatures that have not evolved radically become less efficient as far as their ability to survive and have different niches to to, to procreated so they're limited where they can be 
and what species can, can survive. So I think that's part of it. And yeah, each various period seemed to have a nasty event at the end of it, you know, whether it's the Cambrian, whether it's the Ordovician, you know, the only one that doesn't seem to have one is the Mississippian, because I think they kind of made that period up for some reason, I think a number of years ago. But uh, yeah, the Permian, the end of that, it was just like, boom, that was the big one and 98% of life, or, I think 98% of life in the seas, 90% of life on the planet disappeared at that point. And That'd if that weird. was, Go ahead. That, and they're still speculating, they're saying now it could be due to a string of volcanoes that are where Siberia is now, that spewed so much crap into the atmosphere that it blocked the sun and, you know, that whole process. But that was the big one, much worse than the one, the Quicksilver one, you know, that got rid of the dinosaurs. Right. So uh, that was what killed them off, but they were already very much on the endangered species list at that point. Do you ever think about like, it would be da disastrous for us, but if you ever think like, like of uh, trilobites or cockroaches, or even like uh, tardigrades, if they were the size of us, how quickly <laughs> they would I mean, they're so strong. I mean, even- well, what, what, what fascinates me in that way, imagine if these extinction events had not happened and somehow trilobites had survived in one of this, I'm not gonna talk about the permanent ones, but some of the ones in the Ordovician, and it survived another 250 million years to today. They might be the ruling thing on the planet. You might have a trilobite, you know, who's king of the world. It's, I don't know how better off the world would be, but it would be a certainly a different place. So. Oh, yeah. Well, that is another question. Um, coupled with the stuff I've been talking to people about, did they feel pain? Did they have, a, they didn't, well, I'm going to ask it. I don't think they did. Did they have a self aware? You know, there's no way you can know, but did they have a self awareness? Did they have a consciousness? Did they know they existed? But, well, easier one. I did find one up in New York State. And when I hit the rock, I turned it over and said, Hi, my name is, my name is Ralph. So it may be. There was something, there was a little trilobite party, they were identifying themselves, but that's as close as I ever got. I, I, I can't imagine. I mean, when you step on a cockroach, do you think it's going, oh my goodness, I, that, that's it for me. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I assume there was some sort of nervous system, that I, uh, primitive. They had a, a respiratory system, a pulmonary, pulmonary system. I'm trying to think of the various things they had. So I would imagine there was some nerve ending somewhere. In fact, yeah. there is speculation. I'll give you this one. Some of these have rows of spines down the back, very spinose creatures, especially in the Devonian. And only in recent years when uh, preparation techniques have become better, have people really noticed these things. And there's some speculation now that these might have served not only as rudimentary defensive weapon, uh, uh, weapons, which is what I assume they are, they're saying it's possible there were nerve endings and they could have sensed almost like a Jedi forces in the water that you know, movement and things, and these that's what the spines did. I don't believe that's true. I think they were just there to ward off predators, but uh, there was that speculation so far. What, what, did they, what did they eat and what were their defense mechanisms? They probably ate whatever they could catch. I mean, again, the, the possibility of other trilobites, small soft shell creatures that were there. For every trilobite, you go back to the bird of shell as an example. These soft shell creatures really didn't exist that uh, it weren't preserved very well. You know, hold on, let me get one thing right over here. I want to show you something. This came in. May I do that? Yeah. That'd be great. Not even a trilobite. But this just came in from Morocco. You can see it. But this thing, let's see, is a morella, a morella more. Wow. And these are the kind of soft body things. That's a posneg, but just the kind of cool. And those are the kind of things that swam in the water with trilobites, certainly in the Cambrian. And there's a, there are thousands of species. So I would assume, I should say thousands, but there were many species. And a lot of scientists speculate that they might, the trilobites might have fed on those because there are three or four larger trilobites like in Burgess, Ajagopsa, Solenoides. And there are the morellas up there. There've been 10,000 morellas alone. I'm trying to say that, I think more than that, found just in one location, Burgess. So the numbers game, if you want to look at it that way, there's speculation that some trilobites, think of African savannas, where you have prey animals and you have the predators. And some trilobites or soft body things might have been the same ratio of zebra to lions. So they might have fed upon those, they might have fed upon scraped barnacles off or, or other things off of rocks. It's the thing on the bottom side called a hypostome, which is being speculated on, it's a mouth plate. 
Was it used for meeting to last bond, class bond during meeting? Was it used to scrape stuff off of rocks for feeding? Nobody really knows. Above my pay grade is Yeah, your GS-12. Uh, <laughs> well, so, uh, yeah, at the very beginning, you talk about, you try to, and this was difficult for me to understand. You try to separate collectors out into, I guess, the zeal they have for it, or whether they just see one and they go, I got to have one of these, and then right. how they get hooked into having other ones. And you go, oh, this, you just showed me, this just came in. What do you mean it just came in? Did, did you call someone or did you go to eBay? Did you say, hey, no, how did you? I do. I check eBay every day. There are a couple of sites. There are probably a dozen sites online that only survive by selling fossils. But a lot of times people contact me. And this came, I came from Morocco, as I say, one guy's out there and found that in the field a couple of weeks ago and he cracked it open, says, hey, you have interest and ships it. And these days things aren't going quite as quick as they did maybe two or three years ago, but it takes a couple of weeks and suddenly the doorman you know, ringing the bell and hey, I got this for you. There it is. Does it feel like Christmas morning when one comes in? That's how I am at the bookstore. Well, I'll, I'll go back to my other life in that I used to like to say about rock and roll is that every day I get these packages of CD releases, of album releases, and it was like Christmas morning. I don't get those anymore, so now I replace it, I guess, with the fossils. But you mentioned the collectors. Yeah, that, that is that, look, I don't care if it's Barbie dolls, baseball cards, bottle caps, whatever it might be, there's a real allure to collecting. And if you have that gene, in fact, uh, Mark Norell from American Museum, I think talks about that in one of the other intros in my book, that he says you have, some people have the collector's gene, and whether it's paper doilies or diamonds, you want them. And some people, yeah, are satisfied having one, putting it on the wall. And I know people who have bigger collections than I do, and all over the world, one in France, one in Japan, one in South America, a couple in the US. I mean, it's a, uh, an appealing appeal for some people, and it's a very competitive one. Yeah, it's like me with first editions. I mean, I'm looking at three copies of the stories of Vladimir Nabokov right now. I'm thinking, what the fuck? Why do I have these? And it's like, <laughs> and it's like, it's an addiction, but it's better than freebasing. I mean, I, if you're going to have an addiction, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so like, it's like, yes. And I have a love hate relation. I already read the book. So what do I need it for? I mean, you can go to the museum and look at every kind of, well, no, actually you're probably better than a museum, right? They come here. Uh, literally, the guys from the museum. In fact, the seat I have right here, I set them up at the table right in front of me where the thing is. They bring a microscope, I bring specimens over, and I look at them. That happens quite often. Eventually, I think this stuff will end up at the museum because what else am I going to do with it? But um, right now, it's staying here, let's put it that way, at least for the time being. So you're going to leave everything to the museum? At this point, they're nice to me. Uh, so, and there are other options, but I don't want to sell it. Don't, don't want to do that. So yeah, I have a feeling that it, I already have it written someplace that, yeah, they'll get the stuff. And, yeah, I got uh, this big ass library. My kids don't want it. I mean, it's like, what am I going to do with it? I guess I'll, I'll do the same thing you're going to do. I'll... It's the trouble with collections because yeah. go back to your baseball cards when you're a kid, you know, your mom throws them out, which is why a lot of them are worth stuff. So, you know, I don't want people just to come here, ah, get rid of the rocks, you know, just let's clear this place out. Um, I'm hoping that's true. I mean, I have friends who collect certain things. A good friend of mine collects Inuit art, as an example. And he's having trouble finding a museum that wants it. I'm even trying to get to do a book about it to make it more interesting. Some things museums obviously are attracted to, other things they tend to shy away from, whether it's lack of interest, no department. A lot of them, though, have very limited imagination, I'll put it that way, where if no one is studying it at this very moment, we don't want it. What about 20 years from now, 30 years from now, when the next guy comes in? They might want to. These things have been around for half a billion years. You know, can you think maybe more than you know, two months ahead of time? So that's a little you know, trouble I have with some of the museums that they're all short-sighted that way. Well, you know, plus they have budgets too. So I was wondering how much does all this cost? Like the guy, the guy, one that just came from Morocco, they like, give it to you? Is it $10? No. Is it $1,000? They do a lot of trading, really dealing and stuff. Sometimes they can be expensive. Some of these run into the thousands. Most of them are... 50 to $150, you know, a nice specimen. But you go on eBay, you can find something interesting for $5, you can find something for 5,000. It depends the amount of time it takes. Some of these take 100 hours to prepare. Uh, to prepare. Hold on one second, sorry. I have a garden right out here in the pollen. It looks, like you're, it looks like you're drinking scotch. Uh, no, it's Diet Coke. It is Diet Coke. I started here and I'm all the way down to the bottom trying to make it work. I, you know, I'll say this as a rock and roll guy. 
I don't drink, never have, never done drugs. I don't say I have a pride, just never had an interest. Plenty of opportunity. So I, yes. I, yeah, it just never was my thing. So that's why I survived 30 years in that business. Yeah, yeah, exactly what we were talking about. Yeah. Hey, what's the holy grail? What's the holy grail of trilobites? What, what would you there's like to have better than any? There's a thing from New York State, actually on the Canadian border, Ontario, called Teratasbis, which is a lichen, not to get too fancy, it's a type of genus, but it's about yay big, I would say probably two feet. And up until recently, only parts have been found. Now, the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto put one on display just last year when they opened up their new fossil hall. And that's the only complete one I know, but for years, for many people, that was the holy grail of trilobites. And so one has been found, but we don't know exactly because the story, at least the way I heard it, was the guy who found it died like six months after he took it to the museum and never revealed where he found it. So here they have a specimen and are not sure where it came from. So I don't know if that's changed over the last, you know, six months or so since they opened that display, but that was always the great mystery of, okay, we found one, where did it come from? So but that's the holy grail, I would say. It's so interesting to me, and it probably is the first experience most people have with these, is that if you go to some kind of gallery, you see one that's like, you talk about preparation, it's like all shiny and polished and they look beautiful. Is that considered like gauche to a collector? No. You want it to look as good as possible. I mean, there are some collectors who hate the idea of ever restoring anything. You know, trilobite guys laugh, dinosaur guys, ha ha ha, because they find 30% of a dinosaur, and the word they tend to use is complete. We found a complete dinosaur. No, you found 30%. A trilobite, you find it, and it's missing one little spine. And some collectors, a very good friend in Texas like this, won't even consider it. It's damaged. It's no good. The damn thing's half a billion years old. I mean, so it lost a spine. And it, look, if it lost it naturally, it's one thing. But if it lost it in prep or during the excavation, then it becomes a problem. But no, we want it to look as good as possible. The, the era of breaking a rock and there it's done, that's all we're doing, is gone. The trick now is if you find that, you tend to put them together, prep down, and have the shell complete, and have as nice a looking trilobite and as scientifically valuable a trilobite as possible. In this world and our time, since it's so easy to do like deep fake and stuff like that, how does someone who's really starting out, if they go on eBay or if they go to a gallery, how do they know they're actually getting something that's real? I mean, you can emulate it's it perfectly. The perfect because especially in Morocco, it's become a cottage industry over the last 30 years. Uh, they have plenty of time. They'll take everything from Bondo to mud to whatever. They will take a nice specimen, they'll make a mold. And many times you go to the fossil shows and that's something if anybody has any interest, they must do at least once in their life. Go to Tucson, Arizona at the end of January for the biggest mineral and fossil show in the world. It's a unique experience. There's one in Denver in September. I mean, they have them in all over the world. I mean, I've gone, to, cool. I've gone to Paris for those. The, the Tokyo has them, but the one in Tucson is unbelievable. And you will see tables of these fake Moroccan trilobites. And unlike where you can place one in some sort of exclusivity in a nice glass case with lights on it, they just put the same one in a, in a flat with one after the other looking identical. And hopefully they only charge you for the price for the mold because people have been buying them as real and find out later that they got a fake. And it's something you see all over eBay now. Well, since you, you know, obviously you spend an enormous amount of time doing this, has anything else a piqued? Of love. So. Well, has anything else piqued your interest? Because obviously when you're searching trilobites, like the thing you showed me, you're coming across other things as well. I mean, that's really unusual. That's most of the time, that's not uh, trilobites because there's so many are more than sufficient to maintain my interest. I show that only because it is different because we're talking some of the soft bodied stuff and what they ate. But no, let me, do, let me turn this around just for a second. I don't know if I showed you. I mean, here's a, I don't know if I should do it this way if I'm doing it right. Are you seeing the table? Yeah. Oh, that yeah. was cool. Wait, go back to that black one. That was really right. cool. That one. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That, and, and over here, I hope I, I'm showing this right. I mean, there's a whole stand full of them over there. Can you see that? Yeah. So they're all over the place. I got them behind me and I got them inside. I got them over there, so they're everywhere. But there's, and I'm running out of room. That's my problem. If I had more room, I'd probably get another 2,000, 3,000 of them. But uh, it's a little different uh, when you're running literally. They're on the floor here now and I got to watch my step at night. All the team. 
I don't take I, them upstairs. I like keep them downstairs. But, uh, whatever. Do you have a wife and kids or wife and kids? Or? Uh, no, uh, no. At the moment, I don't have anything right here. And I'm very happy that way. So uh, all good. Yeah. It's the kind of thing that uh, women don't tend not to like them. One I know has adapted them because whatever has learned to like them. Most look at them as cockroaches, and uh, yeah, and I understand that, and I just don't try to have them look at them or care, and I try just to lead them to a direction where there aren't any around. Yeah, if you were at a bar trying to pick up a woman, I don't think it's a really good opening line. No, I, I I tend to still stick to the rock and roll stuff, you know, and even that doesn't work. Oh yeah, I yeah. Used to be a yeah. Lot better. I'm the president of Titanium Records. I always look better than I collect for all of that. So, uh, you know, it's uh, whatever. Yeah, I saw that about Titanium. That's why I said serial careers. Oh, yeah, what, what is the deal with that? So, like, you went from one to the other to the other. And... No, I did it simultaneously. I mean, it was well, that's fairly... right. Yeah. I, mean, I, I always worked out of my home. So, Hit Parade would take me an hour in the morning to crank out a story. And then I'd go do our TV show in the afternoon, which was on the USA Network. I'd go from there, I'd go walk over to Atlantic and do some work on the label and come back and call up some guys and do some trial by stuff. So it was all entertaining. It was all fun. And then go back out and go to a concert. So, oh, talk about different. your, um, is your podcast affiliated with, a, with Columbia? Or not podcast, your, yeah, no, your column? What, what is it, a no, blog? No, the website. No, the website's affiliated with the American Museum of Natural History. So that's, that's uh, if you go on there and type on, Go on Google, type A-M-N-H trilobites. They'll take you to my website. A-M-H-8, American Museum no, of Natural A-M-N-H, History. American Museum of Natural History. So uh, you just wait and let's say just type in trilobites after that. I'll take you right to the website. You'll see about 1,200 specimens. Sorry, that's the phone. Uh, right. 12, 1,200 specimens of mine up there. And some of the stories. And I say a lot of those stories have been reworked uh, for Travels of Travel Bikes. And uh, again, it's all, the whole point of it is just to have the fun of travel bikes and the fun of travel. And it's trying not to be scientific in any way, shape or form. There's a lot of science in there. There's enough meat there, I think, to satisfy someone who wants to learn and to be a scientist and really get into the, the nitty gritty about travel bikes. But my whole point was just to try to convey the excitement, the fun, the Fascinating stories behind the people who collect, the people who dig, the people who have been involved with this for the last couple hundred years. So that was, that's what I think, I, I'm, I'm pleased with the way it turned out. I'd like to finally see the finished copy, but I think it's going to be okay. Yeah, well, that's a good way to end it. I mean, it's like, it'll, I'll get it May 12th and illegally I might open it earlier and put it out. I guess I shouldn't say that. And yes. uh, it's like, remember our mattresses <laughs> do not remove under penalty of law. <laughs> yes. And my brother and I, was, I would always... We move it. I think we were going to go to jail. <laughs> I do. I mean, you're not. So, uh, so. Yeah, I appreciate your time and I appreciate your willingness to try to spread the word about travel bites. And I must say, you're very well prepared for this. Oh, well, thanks ben very much. I'm interviewing you. Let's put it that way. So, okay. all good. Sure, you're we far can, more uh, so. Yeah, but you know, but what did I do? I practiced law. Well, the bookstore is interesting, though. The bookstore oh, sure. is interesting. Next time I'm in Philly, I'm going to come down. Are you actually in Philly? Just outside. Um, yeah, like you just go out the turnpike and pop off and run right there. Yeah. If you ever want to see trial bites in Philly, there's a, one of the top collectors. In fact, he has a whole fossil collection in his home. I won't reveal his name or his address right now, but if you ever do want to see it, I'm sure he'd be very happy to, to host you. In fact, I might go down and see him and maybe we'll all wander over that day. All right. Well, I got your number. And then, you know, maybe, maybe if, if you, you know, again, COVID, but um, yeah, if you're ever around, come by the bookstore, we can do a signing or something like that. And you can bring, oh, you can bring some of your, uh, bring some of your specimens down. People would like that. I could do that. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, about right there. That's 500 million years old. I can't, believe I, I can't believe I have the cover and you don't, and you don't. Uh, well, I have a picture of the cover. Oh, well, that's good. That's what I got. I mean, I've seen it, you know, printed. I had to go edit it, you know, I had to do the final edits on it, but I don't, uh, you know, whatever. Look, I've gone through enough crap with that with Hit Parader over the years where it's oh, supposed, yeah. to be, supposed to be out and just, you know, it's delayed, whatever. This is ridiculous. This is my first book experience. And uh, By the way, my Rock and Roll Memoirs is coming out too, so I'll make sure you get a copy of that. Oh, a little bit yeah. That, yeah, that would be great. That's got to be really interesting. Uh, I'm not so sure, but it'll be, it's entertaining um, it's interesting yeah. with the, with the fine line between the two items 
So all right, well, Andy, thanks. Thank thanks so much for hanging out. I really enjoyed it. It's great. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, sir. Thank See you. you soon. Bye. See ya.